Hi everyone, uh, we're going to start in uh, 10 minutes.
Uh, okay, uh, hi everybody uh, and welcome to the opening of the third season of Infinium Android Talks. Uh, I'm really glad that you're all here. My name is Ivan and I'll give you a quick overview of our Android Talks. So first, let's settle uh, what's this. Uh, Android Talks are, is basically a meetup, but we, we're trying to give you a short lessons up to 20 minutes from a real life. Uh, we want someone who uh, who's got some problems in a real life, he's an Android developer, and he solved it somehow. So I'm hoping he'll give you a solution. Uh, why are you here? I really don't know. Probably to have some fun, learn something new, and to drink uh, cold beer. Uh, let's talk about today. We're going to have four lectures, uh, but the most important part is for the, for the first time, we're going to have our guest lecturers uh, they're coming from a company called Five, Tomislav and Dino. So, yeah, welcome. He's not here today. But... Okay, he's coming from a company called Five. Uh, his name is Tomislav. Uh, Tomislav, welcome. Uh, we're glad to have you here. We have something new today, uh, which we call Infinum Giveaway. Uh, the idea behind this is that all of you which are here uh, post a picture on Facebook, Instagram, uh, or Twitter and add hashtag Android Talks. Uh, we'll uh, choose three best uh, pictures, images, and we're going to give you a gift back. So I encourage everyone here, take out your iPhones and <laughs> take your pictures, uh, Photoshop them, add stickers or whatever you want. Also, if you want to hold a lecture here, uh, you can drop us an email. Uh, we'll talk about it, we'll discuss it, and we'll give you a chance to talk about something cool you did here. Uh, that's it. I hope you don't have any questions for me. Uh, we're going to start now, and the first one is Iman Markusi with Android Design Library. So, Markusi, please. <laughs> My name is also Ivan, Ivan Markusi. I'm here as an Android developer, and in today's first lecture, I'll talk to you about Android Design Support Library. The Android Design Support Library is a part of Android Support Library package. It's developed and maintained by Google. It offers various material design components and patterns that you can use in your application. Uh, the API itself is pretty easy to use, and it better it's compatible way up to API level 7, which is Android 2.1. All you have to do is just pay this line of code to your uh, application's build ready file, assuming that you're using any other Android support uh, library like V4, V7, V5, v view, or anything like that. If you aren't using any Android support library, you should also download the Android support repository. This slide here should act like a table of contents. Here I've listed all the components available in this design library. We'll go to each one of them and show you how they work and how can you use it in your applications. So let's get started. The first one is a navigation view, which is usually placed in see inside the drawer layout, which is a common Android uh, pattern which slides in from the left and acts like a main navigation component of the application. It contains of uh, two parts. The first one is the header and the second one is the menu. You define your header as just another layout and use the menu, the menu resources to define your menus. It's pretty simple and straightforward to use, but unfortunately you can't use anything other than that. You can, I know, perhaps set settings between menu items or use some custom views in your menus or switchers or something like that. So if you need a pretty simple uh, navigation uh, navigation drawer, use a navigation view. For anything a bit complicated, you should probably use uh, fragments like you probably do, meaning that you just declare the, the frame layout inside the drawer layout and inflate your fragment inside. The second one is a tab layout. The tabs themselves are used to represent uh, group content. 
when if you are using tabs, you shouldn't use any other horizontal gestures such as uh, so to dismiss. Unlike the navigation view, the tab layout offers a much more richer API. You can use it pretty simple. Just use one line of coding and it will automatically set up with the view pager. Or you could use your custom views, the chain scroll mode or tab reality, like in this example that is looping. Uh, I forgot to mention all slides, or all videos and pictures from this presentation that are taken from the uh, the design support library example that I uh, made and it's available on GitHub. I'll give you a later. Uh, the next up is text input layout is the most simple. It's just a, a wrap around the class which is the edit text or extends in the edit text. And it uses the hint and error uh, text views of the edit text to display what you can see in the example here. Furthermore, we have a snack bar, which is often referred to as a supercharged toast, meaning that it provides you a lightweight operation about a some action or a system message. But unlike toasts, you can use a custom action and you can select the top of the screen. Next up is call connection button. It's, it's often used in a lot of Google applications such as Gmail. It's used when your application will pri primary has just one primary application. Not all applications should use the call connection button, but if you want to use the fab in your application, you should probably use this one because it's all <coughs> internally this call connection button just extends an image view, meaning that you can just set the draw and change the menu of the icon. If you want to use Something like sub menus or custom animations, you should probably refer to the load connection button library that they are using here at Input Thing. To put together snack bar and load connection buttons, it looks something like this. But to make it all work, both snack bars and load connection buttons should be placed inside of a special frame layout, which is the coordinate layout. The core of the itself is a is the core of the master library itself. It uh, has only one purpose: to coordinate dependencies between all child views. As you can see, when the snake bar is shown, the this should automatically play, but it's not. But the snake bar is uh, animated bottom up, and the and there is a constant distance between the potential button and the snake bar. This is created by implementing extending this class. So you can see there are two main methods: the layout depends on and the on dependent view change. When uh, so to explain it, the snake bar and protection buttons are both placed inside a quarter layout. And when any view inside the corrector view layout changes, the coordinator layout will go through its, the whole view hierarchy and ask in each view, hey, do you depend on this view, which is the value dependency? And you, you should try to cast this dependency to the, uh, to the one that you are dependent on and return true or false. If you return true for that dependent view, the second method on dependent view change will be called. As you can see here, if we are depending on snake bar, we will automatically translate it upwards the uh, y axis. Uh, the last two are application bar layout and a collection for bar layout. The application bar layout, uh, the end bar, it was for, uh, formerly referred to as an action bar. It's a special kind of toolbar. Allowing you, it's primarily used for branding, searching, navigation, and things like that. This is the example usage of it. Uh, the MR cloud can be collapsed into a cloud table, depends on a current cloud. So uh, it won't fit on the screen, but 
the application bar layout has two children, a toolbar and a tab layout, which are and the tab bar layout and the view pager are both inside a coordinator layout. Uh, the application bar layout uh, by itself is scrollable. It just it just extends a vertical linear layout, but in order for it to scroll, it has to have a strong symbol. And by this attribute here, layout behavior. We are declaring that any content inside a view pager which is scrollable, when any strong gesture is made, the application bar will uh, animate accordingly. There are a few strong flags like enter the whole list, enter the list to less, but I don't much more, but I won't describe it here. As you can see in the example, when a, this view pager contains two tabs, each one contains a recycle view, and then recycle the view. When scroll, the scroll gesture is uh, sent to the application bar layout when the, when, uh, and then it animates itself using the given layout stop flex. Uh, the last one is a collapsing turbo layout, which uh, implements a collapsing application bar and it uh, should be placed inside a application bar layout. So, the application bar layout can contain a collapsing global layout, and the application by itself must be inside the score layout. Uh, here I haven't defined any of the attributes, but it has a lot of collapsing modes that you can see in this. So you can see like on the image on the left. When the collapsing mode is off, there's the same multiplier and scrolling between the next scrolling view that is here and the application bar layout and the collapsing tool bar layout. On the right side, when the this text view, which will take the text mode pin, is in the collapsing mode pin, it's self, uh, the, it's, the text view itself won't uh, scroll at all. And in the middle, we have a parallel scrolling mode in which the text uh, you you can uh, you can if you want to define your custom flex uh, modes you have to add an on offset change listener to the application bar uh, and implement it there and you can see in such an example when you scroll the upwards at some point the content is screened and the the title of the text view is displayed. Uh, there's a lot of problem involved. I didn't place it here, but you can find it on my GitHub repository. This just was the last appeal design point available in this library. And to conclude it, to finish, wrap it all up, the support library, the design support library itself contains a lot of unique features like air bar layout. Correct layout and eclipse and global layout you saw before. It's pretty eye catching. It's designed for the material design guidelines. It's more likely to Google is more, more likely to promote your app on the Google Play Store. If you want to create your own implementation, I, I suggest you read the source. The, the, the compiled policy there is no source code available, but not all components of the same level of API. So if for some components like the first action button, you should use some third party libraries. Here are the references. The first one is a cheese square. It's developed by Chris Banks, he's an Android Google developer. Uh, the library came out just a few days after the, the whole library was introduced. The second one is my <coughs> library. My, my library example, and those two are. Google Appeal Design Guidelines and a reference to Android Design Support Division page. And that's one. Bravo! Does anyone of you have a question? Maybe. Sorry. Navigation, navigation, uh, you mean navigation view? view. Yeah. Um, 
Let me just get back to it for a slide. As you can see, you can define your custom layout in the main resource. Uh, if you would try to hack it, you can set this layout to match your parent, and then, then you just have to look at the whole layout in the door layout, and you could uh, put references to any view you want, and you could do all that in your activity, but that wouldn't be a good programming habit. So it's better off to use it in fragments. Okay, so uh, what's the main advantage of coordinator layout uh, when you compare it to relative layout? Because you said you can anchor some mm -hmm. view to the other. Well, you could, I think, do the same thing if you, if you put the bottom view, the one that's popping out, like a match her at, align her at bottom, and the upper view to be above the the first view that was hiding or yeah. you're referring to the step bar. Exactly. No, no, uh, the coordinator layout. Um, it extends the frame layout and uh, it offers you this behavior class. It's a type class. You can put any if you want, being it a default view or custom view, and you can declare all of uh, because you're referring to the whole layout. But if here it's just one of the view changes, the other view will be uh, updated accordingly. So basically, this is a more powerful way to coordinate the two views in hierarchy. But the example you show, it's, this, it would also work with a simple relative layout. That, that's just my question. Okay, so. so the example with stand bars and flotation buttons? Yes. Okay. And I believe there's one more question. Several questions about that stuff. <laughs> about the uh, collapsing format layout, like, uh, have you ever had uh, issues with the pulling functionality while implementing the nested scroll layout? Yes, you can find it on my GitHub repository. <laughs> Did you change the behavior or what? No, no, I didn't have the time. So uh, the other issue is still there, right? Uh, those two methods are, are the only one available. There's also some like on nested frames. On nested fling scroll or nested scroll, I didn't I didn't have the time to do it. Uh, Second question. The coordinator lab. Before the effort. Uh, are you sure that it extends to the frame layout? Because it had some issues when trying to install the frame layout. The coordinator layout? Yeah. Uh, this text was actually pasted from the Java, so I believe that yeah, I mean, it, it extends the screen yeah. inset frame layout. Uh, the coding lab extends uh, the screen instant frame layout and the screen instant frame layout extends frame layout. No more questions. And then <laughs> second up is, I forgot to remember your name. No. So. <laughs> So the next one is uh, Ivan Kust from Infinum, and then Tomislav from uh, Five. Okay, uh, so good evening everyone. I'm uh, another Ivan from Infinum. I'm, I'm one of the Android team leaders, and I'll be talking to you about uh, our development process here in Android. So from the title, you probably think that we're, we think we're pretty, pretty highly of ourselves. Uh, we consider ourselves Navy SEALs when it comes to Android development. I'm going to tell you a little story and explain why is it so. So I have to go from the, from the beginning and go a few years back uh, when it all started. Uh, it wasn't always like that. We weren't so organized in our development. We didn't test our code, uh, we just pushed everything to production and it ended like this. Uh, it started about when Android 2.2 was, was actual and we were working with Eclipse and the Android plugin for, for Eclipse. And the problem was that we were, just, we were just coding. We thought we don't need tests, we're too good for that. We should just you know, write the code and fix everything on the fly as, as we go. 
And well, that's good. That's good at first when you have a smaller project. But as you go, it, it becomes more complicated and it's, it's hard to maintain. I don't have to mention that we didn't do any regression testing. We fixed a bug, introduced a few more bugs, and then fixed those more bugs. And you can see the pattern where, and where it's leading. Uh, at some point, uh, we decided, OK, that's enough. We can't go on like this. We have to change something. We have to get organized. We have to structure our code. Uh, we have to develop a process. For, for developing. So we started with, with, with our code and with our teamwork. As projects grew and as, sorry. Okay, just one question. Yeah. When you were saying testing, do you also mean QA testing or just unit testing and way test case testing, et cetera? Are you talking about both of those we didn't have or you had like QA but not? We, we had QA, but we didn't have any automated tests like unit testing. Yeah. Okay, so uh, back to the story. Uh, as the projects grow, as your, as, yeah, as your projects grow, uh, more people start working in a team, and you start having Git conflicts while working on Git. At that time, uh, we didn't use any strategy. We were just everybody was committing to the master branch, and that became a mess. When when the project grows, when you're working on two related features, in worst cases you have you have to cherry pick some commits, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we started thinking about how how can we improve this. Another thing here is different coding styles. Different people have different coding styles. Some people, for example, like to use spaces. Some people like to use tabs for indentation. And that becomes a real mess, especially when you have to merge something. And another, another very important thing is that you have to be able uh, to respond quickly to the bugs that, that, that happen on your production version. You have to be able to, parallel, in parallel, develop, develop new features and fix the existing bugs. At that time, that was really difficult. Uh, when you have just one one uh, code base, one branch, basically what you would do when, when somebody reports a bug in production is, hmm, OK, my last version was published then. I'm searching for the nearest commit that was to that date. I'm reverting back to it. I'm fixing the bug. I'm publishing the new version. And then I'm applying that again to the to the latest code base. And that's, that's really a mess. Don't do that. So, we started thinking how we can improve that, and the first step was to uh, organize uh, weekly meetings uh, on Mondays. We started we started having uh, those weekly meetings where everybody would say what they were working on the last week, what they're going to work this week. It might it may sound um, I don't know maybe silly at first, but it really helped us because even though you 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 don't work on the same project, maybe you, everybody from the team works on the same technology, and when you share those experiences some ideas come up from that. So one of the ideas that came up from those meetings uh, was to use Gitflow. We heard that people from our web team were using it, so we said, OK, let's give it a try. Let's see what's all, what's, what all the fuss is about. So we started using Gitflow. Um, I won't go into details explaining how it works. Uh, does, does, some, does any one of you use Gitflow? Yeah, OK, there's some hands up. So. You're, some of you are familiar with it. If you don't know, Google it. Um, basically, the idea, the, the basic idea is that you have a mess branch in which you keep stable code, which is in production, and you have a develop branch on which you're working on the new release. And from that, you feature a new branch, you branch new feature branches on which uh, each member of the team can develop a new feature. And basically, you have a stable code base on which you can fix bugs that are in production and then merge them into your development code base. Naturally, with um, GitFlow uh, came pull requests. Um, at first, we were merging the requests from the terminal, you know, just like Git merge from feature branch to development. But we, then we realized, OK, GitHub offers uh, those interactive pull requests. And we started doing code reviews. And that proved to be really useful because we have another set of eyes look at your code. Uh, they, can, they can see some things that you oversaw. And that way, fix a few bugs that, that, that could have appeared um, if, if they hadn't reviewed your code. So that was another step forward. Uh, next thing was the problem that, well, we were still working on the, in the Eclipse with Android plugin and with Ant build system. We didn't have, we didn't have a method uh, to uh, build various versions of the application. For example, the, when you work with the API, 
uh, which most of our applications do, we need to be able to release multiple multiple versions. Uh, the version that works with development API, version that works with test API, etc. So we didn't have one click system in which we could build a version that works with, for example, the, the development and then production. And what we, what we used to do was, you know, comment things in code. And that was really a mess. Sometimes things, that, things from development ended in production that way because we were in a rush to publish something. So basically, when Gradle uh, build system came in, what we did, we used the features from, from that build system. It offers you build types and product flavors. It's like two dimensions when it comes to different different uh, build types, um, meaning that the build type, okay, this is the table where, where you can see uh, what I'm talking about. Uh, we have three, usually we have three different build types. The debug build type means that the version of the application for debugging, it is not obfuscated, the logging is enabled, and you have no crash reporting because every time you test something new in crash your application, you get an email and that's, that's kind of annoying. Uh, the staging version, which is actually the test version, uh, has, is obfuscated because you want it to be as close to the production as, it, as possible, but it still has logging enabled, so you can pull out the log, logs if something crashes, and you have crash reporting enabled. That's the version of the application that you would do in your internal QA and that you would send to your clients. And the third version, release, uh, you use that when you're publishing to the store. That's the build types. Uh, the product flavors, uh, the number of product flavors equals to the number of API environments that you have through the application. And when you structure it like this, you have the ability to, for example, build a uh, debug build for the production API, or um, vice versa, you can build a uh, production build for the debug API, which really helped us uh, to discover some bugs that were, I don't know, happening on production that were uh, caused by pro guard obfuscation, et cetera, et cetera. So this really helped us, and it uh, prevented things from uh, development to end up in production. Okay, uh, after that, we want to go even further, and at this point, we still haven't uh, done anything to make our code more beautiful, more maintainable, more structured. So we came across a model view presenter architecture, and we decided to try. How many of you have heard about model view? Controller or model view presenter? Okay, that's a lot of you. Cool. Uh, so basically, it's a derivative of model view controller. Uh, the main difference is that model and view never co communicate directly; they communicate through the presenter. Uh, the view, in our case, is uh, an activity, a fragment, or a custom view. Um, basically, a UI component, and it propagates UI events to the presenter. Uh, presenter does some logic, and basically, the view is view contains methods to retrieve the data either from your API or for, from a local database on your device. Uh, this is a graph that shows an example of a uh, class diagram that shows an example uh, for the logging uh, screen. Basically, the important thing to note here is that we have an interface that defines each of those, uh, those three uh, roles, uh, an interface for the view, for the presenter, and for the model. And we have an implementation that implements it. <coughs> Why do we do it that way? Uh, because you, you can see here that the presenter, for example, has reference to the model and to the view. And if you uh, make those references to the interfaces, it's easy to replace the implementations. And that way, uh, if you, for example, have two screens that display the same data on a different way, you can just exchange the, the views and leave the same presenter and model implementations and reuse your code. Okay, so at this point we, we had our code um, <clears throat> structured better, it was easier to implement, and we decided to, to start thinking about automated testing. So first we thought about instrument testing, uh, and we tried Robotium library. Basically that's, that's, that's test, th these tests run on an emulator or on real device, and then you specify for example, uh, click on a view that has some text on it and then wait for something to appear and stuff like that, which is cool. You can write, you can easily write tests that way. But the main setback is that you have need to have a real device or an emulator and they really take a long time to execute. We were aiming for something that's going to execute quickly and we can, um, that we can run as, as often as possible. 
So we decided to look at unit testing, and uh, that, that seemed to satisfy our needs. Uh, for example, the first thing that we did was to mock out the view in the interactor and unit as a presenter, because the presenter contains most of, the, most of your logic. Um, after that, uh, we decided, okay, it's, this is cool, this works, this is fast enough, but there's a lot of overhead when you're writing tests. You have to code another view, you have to code another model, um, you have to set up the tests, so we wanted to simplify that process. Um, first thing that we did was we introduced dependency injection, we started using Dagger. Uh, you can check it out on, on the following link. I won't go into details. Um, check it out if you, if you like. That what Dagger does is when you have, you, you need to satisfy the dependencies for the law, for, for the view, for the presenter, for the model. And usually you do that um, in, the, in your entry point, and that's your view. Because view is something, be it uh, activity fragment or custom view, it's, it's the thing that's gonna run first. So in your own, create, for example, in your own create method, you would instantiate your presenter and pass him the dependencies. But using Dagger, uh, you can you can do that, but you set you specify your your dependencies in a separate model, and that's simplifies things. We couple things. Um, after doing that, we started exploring RoboElectric, which is basically a uh, mock Android virtual machine, uh, which allows you to run uh, Android-related stuff on your desktop virtual machine. Uh, what, what, why did we do that? What does it bring you? Uh, the thing is that if you're using RoboElectric, uh, you don't have to rewrite your uh, view implementation uh, because all the Android classes are already mocked, and you can use the existing view that you use in your production application and run it on top of your um, on top of RoboElectric virtual machine that runs on your desktop, so it's fast, uh, and you don't have to write rewrite your your view. Another improvement here is uh, using the mock web server. Uh, why would you do that? Well, basically, unit tests shouldn't depend on on uh, internet or networking uh, because you you want to you want your test case always to be the same. You don't want to depend on something that you can't control. Uh, mock web server gives you the, the ability to start a mock server uh, locally and enqueue um, responses that you wish to get in your tests for your test case. And basically, the only thing you have to do in your tests is just to replace, just replace the endpoint uh, with one, um, your URL for your API, replace it with the one of your mock web server that's run locally. After that, you enqueue your responses and you run your test. Okay, so when we did that, we basically, for our tests, we didn't have to rewrite uh, our views, we didn't have to rewrite our models, we just had to, to write the tests. And we wanted to even go further because if you, if you have a lot of tests, you probably, once you write them, you probably won't run them because when you run tests, you're gonna, you're gonna discover new bugs and it's, you know, more work for you to fix it. So we wanted to make sure that the system forces you to run tests, that it runs them for you, and if you if, you, if your tests are failing, you, that you must fix those bugs, that the system forces you to do so. So we started exploring continuous integration. Uh, how many of you have heard about it or used it? Okay, some of you. So really, basically the idea is that a commit to um, branch starts, starts the text test execution and the dedicated CR server phones your repository, runs the tests and notifies you uh, if the tests are um, successful or if they're failed. Uh, at first we were using uh, Jenkins, it was a lot of pain, it, you, you had to do a lot of DevOps work, so lately we've switched to CircleCI. CI. Um, it only works if you uh, host your repository, if you use GitHub. Um, I advise you to check out CircleCI. It's really easy to configure, and the starting plan is free, so you can try it out for free and see if it suits your needs. Okay, so after we set up uh, automated testing and, and the continuous uh, integration, we started thinking about what can we, what can we uh, improve even more. 
and we came across a few plugins that use static code analysis. And by using static code analysis, you can you can um, do some checks in the code that that would prevent bugs even before you run the code. This is just I'm I'm going to quickly run through this. It's just a few plugins that you can use for static code analysis. Uh, Android Lint is an comes with the Android SDK and does the Android related checks, uh, find bugs does Java related checks. And finally, Textile. Uh, the good thing about Textile is that with Textile you can enforce a certain coding style in your, in your project. Why is that important? Well, take a look at this diff. Uh, that's basically the same code, but the only difference is that the overhead annotation is, in the, is not in the same line uh, in the green chunk below. So basically, if you don't have the same coding styles between all the team members who work on the code, uh, it's easy to get uh, unreadable diffs like this. So you check that. Okay, uh, we're almost done. We're almost there. Uh, the last step that we had to do was close the development circle. Uh, so we started tracking uh, the application after it was released. We have our own. Um, we have our own uh, store, similar to a Play Store, where we upload our all our applications that go to the acceptance testing for the clients. It's called the Tinum Labs. Um, that's a part of our internal system, yeah. And basically, we have an Android library that notifies our clients whenever a new version of the application is is available. Uh, that's the first part, and this is how it looks like. And after we deploy the application. Uh, we track the uh, Google Analytics or Crash Analytics for the ongoing crashes, and if something occurs, you can um, easily uh, fix it even before the client realizes it. Be, be really responsive, and that's something that closes our um, development development circle because after you've done everything, you check for bugs, and if, if there's a if, if a bug occurs in production, you go through the whole process again. So to recap. Um, We've organized a teamwork. Uh, we've started monitoring the code quality, structured the code better, introduced automated tests and static code, checks uh, started tracking uh, applications when they're in productions. And of course, all of this comes comes with a cost. Uh, meaning the initial setup project setup takes a little bit more time, and the learning curve is, is steeper for all, all the new members who who uh, join your project. Um, all right, uh, but um, I think the pros uh, outweigh the cons because, first of all, you get the confidence. You get confidence in your builds, and that's why we believe we are Navy SEALs because we're really confident about the code that we write now. Uh, you get more maintainable code, and most importantly, you get regression testing that you know, didn't have in the start. So, to sum it all up, this is the graph that displays our um, development cycle. And I'll let you soak it in. And if you have any questions, now's the time. Okay. Uh, I think they're already published on SlideShare. Okay. So tomorrow they'll be on SlideShare, Facebook, and all the events. They'll have those. Uh, sorry, you. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about this mock web server? Mock web server. Uh, so basically, mock web server is a part of the OKHTTP library. That OKHTTP is a, um, it's based on URL connection. It's a HTTP client, and it, it enables you to start a local server. And once you start it, you can start enqueuing responses to it. So you say, um, in your test, for example, you say, okay, I want this, this response is the next response that the server is going to return for any request that I send to it. And it's, it's easy to configure the server for your particular test cases. Uh, so just by order of... Yeah, the way you, in the order you, that you enqueue the responses to your server, it's going to return them in that, in that order. Okay, okay. yeah? Uh, how rigorous are you with style enforcement? So do you follow all the fine bugs and check style rules or just some? Uh, well, basically, we just enforce the check style rules, and for the fine box, we usually we don't enforce all the fine box rules, and it depends on the project. If it's a legacy project that 
has a lot of code that still isn't uh, refactored and doesn't apply everything. We don't enforce all the, the fine box rules, but we enforce all the check style rules. And for the check style, we found a uh, default, um, not default, uh, the configuration for, for the Android coding styles. So we enforce those. Yeah. Um, about those CI environments, so yeah. assuming Jenkins is outdated and hard to configure, uh, is there anything else that's more modern, easy to use, but that, that is self-hosted because both Circle CI and Travis are uh, cloud solutions? Uh, actually, I, I'm not sure. I know about only only about Jenkins. It's self-hosted. I, I don't know about other self-hosted solutions. The, the cloud services were good for us because we didn't have to do all the DevOps work. And we chose them for that reason. Yeah. How do the tests on machines and UI? I mean, how do you ensure that uh, when uh, someone quickly starts and uh, stops the activity, there are no animations left to crash the app after the activity is closed? Can this be automatically tested? Okay. Um, well, I think the Rob RoboElectric does that. Uh, you can you can test it with RoboElectric, but I'm not 100% sure how, how it handles animations. Uh, basically, we don't do just unit tests. Our testers do the you know test by hand before I really release. Unit tests are something that run on runs on every commit. So when you're merging a pull request to the development branch, you all the requirement is that all tests are passing. So we still do testing by hand for releasing, and we would test that what you mentioned when testing by hand. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, are you doing the test run development or are you writing tests after? Um, well, I'll admit, usually we, we, write, we write tests after we develop something. We don't use test run development yet. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you write tests? Uh, do you write tests on two levels? Uh, in the sense, if you are testing the presenter, you would mock out the view and the model. And the second level would be you don't mock anything, you just use the, the RoboElectric. Uh, we, just, we just use that, that second level. We just use RoboElectric because it's, because it's faster and it enables us to write more tests. I think it's better to write more tests than tests. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, do you then uh, mock out? Uh, so you use the mock uh, server for the networking? Yeah. In your tests, uh, how do you uh, test asynchronous scores? Do you like, use time oh, or...? That's a good, that's a good question. Um, uh, when it comes to, to yeah, all your HTTP requests are requests are asynchronous. So we use Retrofit library for all our HTTP requests. And um, when we configure um, our networking for, for the tests, you can, Retrofit enables you to pass the executors meaning you can tell them on which thread to execute the HTTP request and the callbacks. Um, so we use that functionality to execute everything synchronously in tests. So we configure retrofit to execute synchronously in tests, so we don't have any problems with, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, what about the other dependencies like the database or the random services? Do you move that out or? Um, well, it, it depends on the case. Uh, RoboElectric supports uh, SQLi database, and basically all ORMs that we use are dependent on that SQLi. Uh, the only thing is that RoboElectric clears your database between tests, so you have to take care about that. But basically, yeah, it depends it depends on our on our own project and test cases. But we we usually don't mock out; we just yeah yeah do use the robot. Um, well, it's it was hard to set up. I think now it's uh, it's become stable and it's well integrated into Android Studio. If you're using the 1.4 version of the Android Studio and 1.3 version of the Gradle, it's easy to configure RoboElectric. And I'm talking about RoboElectric 3.0. Um, but there were some issues in the past. Basically, there were issues with making it run and configuring everything. Once you get started, it's easy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You mentioned that one of the cons using this process is the steep learning curve for new members. So how do you solve this problem? Uh, we have an onboarding process that every every 
every person that joins Android team has to has to go through on the start of, of his or hers employment. And yeah, basically in that process, you, you learn all the technologies that are involved in here and you're ready to, to start working on, on the project. Okay, so new team members don't jump, just jump in on your project, they first? Yeah, first they have to complete an onboarding process that's, I don't know, for a week or two. And after that, they join on the project. And then after some time, they've been working on a project with a mentor. Um, it depends on a person how, how long uh, do you get to work with a mentor after you've you know, grown and learned everything, you can work on your own projects. Yeah. yeah. Do you force any specific test coverage, for example, 78%? Uh, no, no, not yet. We're, we're thinking about that. We're exploring more possibilities, but still, we're still not enforcing any test coverage. Okay, and have you tried any other mock letters, for example, Power Mock, J Mock, Mojito? Uh, we've tried Mojito on some, some projects, but that's it. That's basically it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Do you have any ideas for future improvements? Future improvement, um, well, enforcing the, the percentage of test coverage, and I don't know, maybe start using some instrumentation tests as well. But we're still kind of figuring out how to pair that with some cloud service like Circle CI. Basically, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so the next one will be uh, Tomito from uh, Five. Uh, until he's ready, feel free to take some beer and juice and something there, whichever you want. And uh, also, don't forget to post the images on social networks with hashtag Android Talks if you want to win an Infinum uh, bag. Okay, guys, uh, we can continue. We can talk later, guys. We can talk later after the event. Please sit down. Uh, we can continue. Just be patient for a half an hour and drink. <laughs> uh, so I'm Tomiso from Five Agency, and I'll give you a little intro to Kotlin. 
so uh, we'll talk about a little bit about Java and Android alternatives, then Kotlin. Uh, things aren't perfect, so there are some disadvantages and features. And finally, migration of existing project. Uh, actually, I'll skip through first intro part quickly because I don't have enough time. <laughs> Uh, and we will focus on a code. Uh, okay, so uh, these these are standard things that uh, Android developers complain about Java. Uh, still no support for Java 8, uh, null references, uh, message generics, uh, row types, SAM types, checked exceptions. And uh, these are some of the alternatives. Extend, Scala, Groovy, nice thing, Closure, uh, etc. But uh, this talk is about Kotlin, so uh, we'll focus on that. Uh, okay, some advantages. Uh, so this is sales part of the talk. It's modern statically typed object-oriented language uh, has many functional features. Uh, if you know Java, uh, it has fast learning curve, and it's meant to be used for building large software systems. At least the guys that made Kotlin say that. Uh, and it's highly interoperable with Java, so you don't have any problems of, uh, while using existing Java libraries. Uh, the thing behind is JetBrains, the guys that made IntelliJ and Android Studio. Uh, which is based on IntelliJ. Uh, creator, or, or creator of Groovy has made some contributions. Also, uh, uh, it is signif significantly more readable than Java, and that means that it's, uh, the code is easier to maintain and easier to understand. Uh, it's lightweight. So Kotlin SRL lib has only 8K methods. I checked that a few days ago. Uh, with the latest, latest version, while Groovy has 30k, <coughs> Scala 80k, and yeah, uh, and it also compiles to JavaScript if it means anything to anyone. <laughs> Maybe uh, if you want to program uh, inside of the web view, if you have hybrid app, something like that, you can do both in Kotlin. Uh, Disadvantages, uh, code generation, uh, it works for now, it's limited, dagger two works. <laughs> uh, mocking and testing, uh, I managed to run some tests uh, with Mokito, I haven't done serious testing, uh, they say it works great, but I have to try, try that still. And IDE was a bit unstable a few months ago. Uh, it is fine now, uh, and it will get only better because uh, the same guys made Kotlin and Android Studio. Uh, immutable collections. So uh, Kotlin relies heavily on immutable collections, and uh, you have to be aware of that. So. If you fetch some collection from Kotlin code in Java and try to mutate it, so add something or delete, uh, it will break. It will throw an exception. Uh, it's a new language, still evolves. Uh, final release is near. Uh, and interoperability with the new compiler, it should be all right, but we have to monitor the situation. <coughs> Uh, and finally, okay, cool. Uh, so I will, I will give some comparison between Java and Kotlin. I don't know if you can see this clearly. These are obviously screenshots, so it's a little bit blurry. Uh, so functions, uh, declaration, uh, it's a bit different in Kotlin. We have the keyword fun and you don't have to explicitly uh, 
emphasize the return type, but you can if you want. Uh, parameter types. Uh, so uh, type, types go after the, the parameter, as in Scala or Swift. And uh, you have compact way of declaring a function if you have only one expression. Or if compiler can infer the type, you can uh, compact it even more. Uh, default parameters. So this Java ex example is probably familiar to you. So lots of overloaded methods. Uh, in Kotlin, uh, we have default parameters. So all of this, these five methods can be replaced with just one. Uh, another cool feature, name parameters. So uh, I hope you use builders in Java. Uh, but uh, when using Kotlin, you don't have to. You have named parameters. So uh, and the order of parameters is not important. So it replaces the builder better. Mm. OK, functions are first class citizens in Kotlin. So, uh, in Java, you have to use uh, functional interfaces to do stuff like this. And in Kotlin, you can just uh, declare a function as a data type. And you can pass it around in other functions and uh, do lots of cool stuff with it. Uh, okay, of course, you can do it in Java, but uh, it's not actually a first class citizen. You have to use in interface. Uh, lambdas, not on Android. You can use uh, retro lambda, but it's a hack. And Kotlin has them. And uh, so the first example is uh, how do you use lambdas in Kotlin? And the second one, uh, if uh, lambda is a uh, last parameter in a function, you can put it outside of parameters list. Uh, so you can uh, you can get some GRU GUI style code. <coughs> and uh, OK, you can do stuff like this last example. So this looks like uh, GRUI code, <coughs> like a DSL. Uh, retrofit example, so this looks pretty messy using Java. Uh, also, lots of uh, anonymous implementations of interfaces. And in Kotlin, uh, it's pretty decent. Uh, it's more readable and easier to maintain. Uh, and the last thing about functions. Uh, so in Java, uh, we use lots of uh, utility classes and methods. And uh, in Kotlin, instead of them, you can use uh, extension functions. So you can write the code like this. Uh, types. So um, Kotlin infers types. Uh, so it's not dynamic language. You'll still get compile time error. But uh, you don't have to explicitly uh, give a type of a variable. Uh, and um, uh, in Java, uh, it's a good practice to uh, use final keywords. So make your variables uh, immutable if you don't uh, intend to change them afterwards. Uh, but most of the guys uh, forget that for some reason. And in Kotlin, uh, you use a keyword value that stands for value. So uh, you will still get compile time error. And I thought, can you see that? Yeah, if you try to change the, the constant after it's declared, uh, you'll get compile time error. Uh, so Java has fields, Kotlin has properties. This is similar, almost the same as in C-sharp. So uh, 
in Java, you have to declare getter and setter. And uh, in Kotlin, uh, you declare property just as you would declare a field in Java. And the compiler automatically generates getter and setter for you. And But uh, if you do need some validation like this, this is Java code, uh, you can still have it in Kotlin. You just have to override the, the accessors. Uh, if you want to hide setter, for instance, you can declare it uh, private. And notice that uh, uh, in this testing code, uh, you can assign a value to a property just as you would assign it to a field. But actually, setter gets uh, executed. And yeah. Uh, this uh, dollar signed variable, it is actually, and uh, Kotlin generates that for you if you want to do some validations. Uh, now save this. So uh, this code miserably in Java. Uh, so we have some function that randomly returns uh, now. And uh, you will get now pointer exception, uh, but in Kotlin uh, you cannot do that. So uh, all the objects in all the types in Kotlin are uh, now safe by default. So you will get compile time error if you try to return now from a function. Uh, but if you want to do that, uh, you have to. Uh, explicitly say that. So uh, you can see if in second function uh, that it returns Kotlin model uh, question mark. So that means that uh, that type is uh, nullable. It can be uh, null. And if you have need for that, you explicitly want to use nulls. There are still some uh, things that help you deal with that. Uh, for instance, uh, OK, we have two models. Uh, model one is uh, cannot be now, it's safe, and second one can be. So, uh, if you want, if uh, you want to access first model, it is safe, it cannot be now. But you, uh, if you want to access the field of the second model, you will get compile time error, uh, and to access the model you have to explicitly use a uh, safe call with question mark. And that means that uh, if Kotlin model two is now, this bar two uh, variable will be evaluated to now, but it won't crash. Uh, also, uh, another cool thing is Elvis operator. So uh, this means that uh, bar foo, uh, will get evaluated to optional three if Kotlin model two is not now, but if it is, uh, it will get evaluated to default value, this one, two, three. And the last thing is a uh, smart cast. So uh, this last line, uh, compiler knows that in this branch of execution, uh, model cannot be now. So it will uh, make a safe cast to safe model, and you can access it uh, normally like any other. Uh, casting, OK. I already mentioned smart casts. So in Java, you have to explicitly cast an object uh, uh, and in Kotlin, uh, in this if statement, Compiler knows that it is a string, so you don't have to cast it. It will be casted automatically. Uh, data classes. Uh, so we have some business logic here. And of course, we want to do models to be equal. And uh, in Java, 
you have to do lots of work for that. Okay, you can generate the code, but still if uh, somebody wants to read it, it's, it's messy. And in Kotlin, the same thing. Notice that you don't have to use equals. Uh, use uh, equals operator and it calls equals function. Uh, you can use data modifier. So uh, compiler then generates uh, some useful stuff for you. Uh, hash code equals to string, uh, uh, copy constructors, I don't know, lots of stuff. Uh, and collections, so this is typical data repository in Java. Uh, we read some data source, some models from data source, and we will do some filtering. And this is lots of error prone work. And if I'm the uh, new developer on this project and I see this function, uh, it's hard to see what, what does it do. So this uh, models by name, iterates over it. Okay, it filters it by age and takes first four of them. And maps, yeah, it returns list of names. So it maps model to string list. And in Kotlin, it's the same stuff. Notice, notice that uh, collections are immutable, so you cannot add something afterwards, after it is created, because you'll get compile time error. <coughs> and this is the filtering in uh, Kotlin. So it has powerful collection framework. This is totally readable. And uh, there are some alternatives, same stuff. Um, okay, last example, uh, this is map iteration in Java and in Kotlin, uh, <coughs> you can iterate, uh, so this is called multi-declaration, uh, you can iterate uh, in tuples over, over a hash map and uh, also, you have string templates that replace string format. Uh, it's a cool feature. Uh, and, okay, ranges. And just the last example down there is something that looks like Java 8 streams for each statement. You can also use that alter alternative approach for iterating, iterating over collections. You don't have to use a for statement. And I think that's it with examples. Yeah, out of scope are, so this is just an intro, generics, annotations, reflections, lots of more complicated stuff. Oh, of course, you have reference. And okay, migration. So uh, I don't have much to say here. Uh, you have a, Kutlin, uh, a cookbook on uh, official pages. You should use convert code and clean code options. Uh, it used to crash on Mac, still crashes. Sometimes uh, you just need to clear that DS store uh, files. Uh, actually, a few months ago, this list was much, much longer. And this whole talk uh, was supposed to be about uh, migrating a project, but there are no problems now. And yeah. That's about it. So, <laughs> some questions? Yeah. Can we try to use in the production environment? Uh, yeah, actually, we have a uh, half of the project in Kotlin. <laughs> it's not full Kotlin. Uh, I'm converted in next, I don't know, week or two. Uh, and it works fine. Now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I didn't know your name. There was an application, the same application using Java and using Kotlin. Was the style of the APK? 
uh, the size uh, so uh, Hotline uh, it is approximately the same there are no uh, the runtime is small just you have to include one small library and that's it You mentioned Arts Java at the, the, the retrofit part. Yeah. So you already answered this, but comparing to Arts Java, which is better for you and which is more safe for the production? Uh, compared How would to you compare the two? To Kotlin? To Kotlin, yeah. Uh, we, use, uh, we use it parallel, so uh, it doesn't uh, exclude Kotlin. Rx Java is. Uh, it compiles to Java bytecode, and we still use uh, observables. We just yeah. use it from Kotlin code. So you use the R Java with Kotlin? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you have an, uh, an extension library for that, or is it just a There is Eric's Android library, but uh, actually they, re they remade it now yeah. from scratch. But it only adds, uh, from that library, we use only uh, Android schedulers and I don't know, few useful methods for handling uh, subscriptions with but, fragments and activities. Yeah, but is this specifically for Kotlin? Is there something special that needs to be done for it? No. So it works out for us? Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's just another library that you, that you consume from Kotlin code. Yeah. Yes? What about performance inputs? Uh, we showed that uh, some things are much easier to write in Kotlin than in Java, but are they necessarily faster or slower? Because uh, some things that are easy to write in Kotlin may be uh, written in Java with some third-party libraries that are possibly more optimized than default uh, Java versions of the containers. And what about Kotlin? Yeah, uh, I haven't done any measurements yet. Uh... It seems uh, roughly the same. Uh, what worries me, uh, uh, you cannot run, for instance, Lambdas on Android because uh, the virtual machine is different. It doesn't have an invoked dynamic call, and Kotlin does it in spite of that somehow. I haven't seen the generated code. It's still the bytecode. Uh, for example, I mean, uh, what if you want to uh, have a parallel traverse over the map? For example, to, ex to execute uh, something for, for every uh, map entry in parallel. Can you do that with Kotlin? In parallel, how do you mean? I mean, for example, if you have a large map, yeah, and uh, you want to perform some operation on every, on every uh, double of the map. Yeah. And uh, because these, uh, you, you can ensure that uh, elements in this map uh, are uh, the, the, the things that you want to perform mm -hmm. are trivially parallelizable. Mm -hmm. So uh, you don't have to use the single threaded for loop. You can simply yeah. execute uh, that uh, kernel functor on some thread pool. Yeah, yeah, there are Java libraries for them. Yeah, I see. That, yeah, you still have to use third party libraries because it's not parallel. But it, uh, this is just a replacement for uh, standard for loops in Java. But you cannot do mapping, sorting, filtering, and stuff like that, for which you also have third party libraries. Yes? Have you tried using the Android Kotlin plugin, also written by JetBrains? Uh, I use it, but I think that it's deprecated now in latest, in latest version. I did use it until a few days ago, and when I upgraded Android Studio, it removed it. So now I have only Kotlin plugin. Yes? Uh, did you encounter any issues with using existing libraries written in Java? No. So everything works out the bugs. Uh, for now, yes. Yeah. Um, what about static code analysis? Is there something you take into limit? Um, it's still um, uh, it's too early. Still. There is some, yeah, but uh, I don't think it's as powerful as for Java. But, um, final question: uh, Compared to all those languages you 
How would you yeah. compare Clubhouse against them? Uh, well, I think about extent. I think you were talking about that on Dreadcon. Uh, but you said that uh, it's hard to work it with, with it in practice. Uh, I, was, I was thinking about Groovy, and I think it's the best al alternative to Cox. <coughs> and also great language, but uh, I don't know. Considering purely Android development, I think Kotlin is the best. Maybe the main reason is uh, because uh, the same team is behind Android Studio and Kotlin. Groove is also nice. Uh, you mentioned that uh, Kotlin is good for Android. What about combining uh, with uh, native uh, development of Android? In Java, you can simply tag a method as a native and then implement it in a C or C++. Can you do the same mm. thing? I believe so, but I haven't done it. <laughs> uh, make adapter over Java code, <laughs> but you can probably do it. Sorry, I'm not hundred percent sure. Our last lecture today is filled with uh, Vision API. Here we go. Okay. Hey guys, I'm Phil Winkovich and I'm an Android developer here at Infinum, and today I'll, I'll give a quick talk about Vision API, the new, the new library from Google used for space detection and barcode detection. Uh, space detection includes uh, detecting faces in videos and, and, and photos, and it enables you uh, to implement face tracking, which uh, works for videos as uh, as a person moves in the video, the face will be tracked and uh, uh, follow the, the face around the video. Remember its uh, position and all that stuff. Face rotation, uh, it enables you to find the rotation of the face uh, from the initial position. Uh, face landmarks include eyes, nose, uh, Ears and you can the position of those landmarks on a face. And classifications include uh, detecting whether an eye is open or whether the, the person is smiling or not. This is an example app from the Google samples. As you can see, uh, the app detects face and uh, draws an overlay around each of those. Uh, contains just camera source preview, which contains a surface view to what the camera sees, and the graphic overlay, which draws the overlays around the faces. Uh, to implement face detection, you only need to use three or four face detector, which uh, does the, the detection. Itself and uh, it uses a multi processor to pass the detected faces. The multi processor then uses the tracker factor, which creates a tracker for each of the faces detected. And the uh, camera source uses the uh, receives the, uh, the detector in the builder uh, uh, and source. Uh, you can also specify the uh, resolution of the of the image you're taking, the scanning, uh, also the FPS and a lot of different parameters. Uh, the track of factory uh, receives a face, each face detected, and it creates a, a face tracker for each of those. And the 
tracker contains a couple of uh, different methods. The important one is on object, which receives the base object itself, and you can use the you can find the different uh, fields in the base uh, base class, including the position of the eyes, nose, and different things. Thing you need to do is to preview and pass the camera source and the graphical way to draw the overlays. And that's pretty much it. A couple of those uh, classes and uh, face detection works. The barcode is real similar, similar and enables the end to the barcodes and it automatically parses the data from the barcodes. So you can uh, scan uh, barcodes or information, asset info, and a couple more things. The layout is the same. Camera source preview and graphic overlay. Same things. Basically, you just replace face with barcode and you'll start tracking barcodes. Uh, also, create a factory, set the multiprocessor, and create the camera source. Uh, the factory creates a tracker for each of the barcodes detected, and also in the on update method, it receives the barcode. You can, uh, you can use a, a number of different uh, fields in the barcode class. One is display value, which is a, a human readable value of the barcode data. And you can check the format of the data the barcode contains. So as I said, our contact info. And in this example, uh, to print, uh, to use the, the data, for example, the format of name, you just uh, access it directly like this. And that's pretty much it. There are only a couple of classes you need to use. Uh, this is the, these are the links to the documentation and the guides and the samples by Google. There are four samples, uh, a face tracking application, barcode tracking, <coughs> multi-tracking, which uh, does uh, face tracking and barcode tracking at the same time. And that's pretty much it for me. It's pretty simple to implement and use. Any questions? Yes. How well does it perform on low budget devices with low camera resolution? Uh, the, the lowest end phone I used was Moto E, and the barcode detection was instant. As soon as the barcode uh, came into the field, field of vision of the camera, it instantly was detected. Yes. Are there any specific hardware requirements? Uh, no, I, I don't think so. I tried on the different phones and they all work. Uh, only thing is uh, out of focus. If the uh, phone doesn't support it, the barcode, uh, the detection won't really work because it will have trouble detecting it. Um, what about uh, camera error handling? How does, how does this work? If camera is, for example, busy or not available, do you get an error or uh, does the app crash? Uh, actually, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't think you'll be able to just start the, the, the detection. I'm, I'm sure it will uh, draw an error. I'm not sure about it. Uh, what about the uh, if you want to uh, change the layout of uh, how your cam camera preview is layout inside your uh, activity, are you able to do that? Yeah, you can extend, uh, in this example, the camera source preview. It contains a surface view. And then you set uh, the dim dimensions and your attention yourself. It's actually in the samples on the GitHub. And I've, I've seen that uh, there are um, methods to, that in which you tell the requested preview size. Yeah. Uh, what if the camera does not support that uh, preview size? Uh, is that uh, 
does it have some callback uh, to your size or it's simply crashes? Uh, yeah, I think it will use the largest it can support if needs. Okay. okay, guys, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we're done here. Uh, no one posted anything on social networks with hashtag and talks, <laughs> so no one will get our gift bags. Uh, please stay around a bit and grab a drink. Thank you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.